had the opportunity to be introduced to a company that I had never been, I had never heard of. And to find out the work that they were doing was, um, was really, it was honestly really special work. <laughs> um, and really deep, uh, deep healthcare work, and I, I, I'd like to call it like the healthcare company that you've all, none of you have heard of yet, but after today, you will. Um, I'd like to welcome to the stage to talk about how they're doing this, um, Arsha Vahabzadeh, who is a doctor now, uh, <laughs> Chief Medical Officer, Officer of Brain Power, who's gonna lead this discussion. You guys can come on up with Matthew Vaughn. He's the president of Contact Richard at Patel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much, Jill. Um, in having this discussion, Jill mentioned Battelle. And one of the things that struck me is I'd heard a little bit about Battelle, and I didn't know a lot. So I wanted to find out more, obviously. And I found out that Battelle, as an organization, is enormous. $6.3 billion of revenue, over 22,000 employees, and conducting science and research across many different verticals. I think there's about seven different national government centers that Battelle co-runs or runs for the government. So in saying that, I'm joined by uh, Matt Vaughan, who's a president of research at Battelle, to talk a little bit about what Battelle does, what he sees as some of the most difficult challenges in healthcare space, and what the potential is for people in the room to perhaps utilize or seek Battelle's help in giving them the edge or supercharging them. Matt, it's wonderful to have you. Thanks, Arsha. It's great to, great to be here, and thank you for uh, setting this up. Um, Sean, a little earlier, asked if there were any other designers in the room, and he got a pretty surprising response. As in the back, I counted, he had about 10, 12 people. Can I ask, and, and I can kind of see hands, who in here has a good feel for Battelle or has heard of us? OK. Well, I think I beat, I beat the designers a little. That's great. Um, so uh, for the rest of you, we've been around 90 years. We're the world's largest nonprofit research and development organization. Um, we're uh, headquartered at Columbus, Ohio. We were founded by the will of an industrialist who had a frustration 90 years ago uh, of seeing great technology on the bench in the lab and not getting to the consumer. In that case, his consumer was a soldier. And so he, institute, he, he left his, his uh, wealth to create this institute, the Battelle Memorial Institute. And for 90 years, we've been working in advanced materials, chemistry, biology, and data sciences now um, to bring that technology from the bench, from the lab, from academia to the consumer. We do that with and through partners. And uh, it, it's an honor to follow to the stage J&J &J and others. We work for J&J, &J, we work for uh, Lilly and Pfizer and many of the others who bring you the great products that you have that transform consumer experiences and health. Um, the other really important thing to emphasize about Patel is that we're a nonprofit. Uh, Mark a moment ago said, you know, we don't know how dynamics change and, and where people will be in, in the future. Well, we've been here 90 years. We're going to be here another 90. We're not going anywhere. We're not trying to exit. We're not trying to IPO. And uh, frankly, we can't, we can't be bought. So we get to do the coolest thing in the world, which is work on science and technology to support industry, transforming, transforming the human experience. And if we have any proceeds from that, which we do from time to time, we educate children. We build STEM schools, science, technology, engineering, and math schools. And with those schools, we build the next generation of innovators, engineers, scientists, mathematicians, who will transform health more and more and more. It's about the coolest thing you can do for a job, to work in science and technology and help pay it forward to a kid. One of the things I was really blown away by is the breadth and depth of the expertise at Patel. So it appears that you have expertise in energy, expertise in biodefense and medical devices. Can you speak to a little bit about this, this breadth that you, you have? Yeah, thanks. The, um, the power of our institute is that we are multidisciplinary in science and enabling that with engineering. And by uh, taking our engineering capabilities, applying them to these multidisciplinary sciences, we're able to get things real fast. And, and following that mantra of get it off the bench and out of the lab and out of academia and into the hands of a consumer through, uh, through our partners uh, is powerful. In, um, we've probably worked in just about every domain you could imagine. In um, some of the things you, you, you've all heard but don't use anymore uh, that, that we actually founded, the CD-ROM. 
um, you know, millimeter wave technology that we all get scanned at by the, you know, coming through the airport. Um, you know, the uranium for the Manhattan Project, tank armor, uh, it goes on and on and on. And um, on all of those instances, the power of what we do as a scientific research organization is to combine disciplines to combine a materials discipline with a bio discipline, which we're working right now in, in the molecule space, to combine the engineering underneath the science to make it real and get it from the lab through FDA or other uh, regulatory authorities and into market as fast as possible. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing space. Uh, our, our scientists and engineers almost all have multidisciplinary fields themselves. You go in the lunchroom and you'll meet a biochemist who is a you know, theoretical uh, uh, physicist also. It's, it's a pretty cool th place. And that's our power, is that we combine and have the breadth and depth to tackle any problem. Now, I know you have a, um, as your role as president of research, and we've had some discussions, you've got a tremendous overview about what some of the thorniest and most difficult issues that you see kind of companies approaching you about, and you have to really kind of supercharge their research or help them overcome. What are the kind of critical issues or technologies that you are getting asked to help with or you are getting asked to address for these companies? We're working um, in some fields that are probably the generation beyond the digital era. The, the digital technology that you see today, the analytic and the app that uh, is transforming population health management, allowing, as Mark uh, referenced, the transformation of the clinician-patient uh, relationship is extremely powerful. It's all predicated on a silicon chip, right? Um, the most complex machine man's ever invented is a microprocessor. 14 nanometer gate array and, and millions of gates, um, so complex that we probably don't even understand its true behavior. And, and yet, what we're seeing now is the potential of the next generation of processing in the micro space being biology. Um, working with, with firms in the synthetic DNA space, what we see them doing is discovering a operating system and code of life that's always been there that we've never understood. And where we've created the code that is the digital code of today, that code that is the digital code of life is orders and orders and orders of magnitude, bigger, more complex than what we have today. The challenge is, as that unfolds and unwinds and we work the discovery process of the code of, of, of organisms, how do we ensure that we have a control of what we're doing? How do we ensure that we have um, an understanding of the implications of that? And, you know, the, the, I didn't even get to 17 minutes before I threw AI out, but there you go. Um, we, we're very well convinced that the machine learning, AI, deep learning aspects of the sci data science we do will enable that to, to be utilized in powerful and transformational ways. Uh, we'll talk in, in a few minutes, hopefully, about a couple of areas where we've made it real, where we've taken um, AI, ML, and we're not talking about what will be. We're doing it today in these big domains. The other big domain that we see that you work in, Arsha, and your company's done some amazing things in, in the field is in neuroscience. And as, as big as the, the uh, code of life is, the human brain and its behavior it, and the neurosystem, the neurological systems and its interactions are, are only now beginning to be understood. To be able to unpack that and understand how to take advantage of that and understand the unintended consequences and manage them is something that's probably bigger than we can analytically do without the power of AI and ML. And again, we've taken that and reduced it to real today, and, uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. You mentioned uh, the kind of breadth of uh, different services at Battelle. And how many times when a company uh, approaches you for a partnership, do you have to rely on using multiple different verticals at Battelle in a way that if a company wanted to try and get that on its own, it would have to spend an enormous amount of time trying to source engineering or microfluidics or expertise from other sectors that is just not on tap. Uh, again, I think it's a great strength of ours um, is that breadth and depth. And, and it's generally why when the problem gets really hard, um, we get the opportunity to work for some of the greatest companies in the world and some of the greatest innovators and inventors in the world bringing things uh, to market. Um, We've probably gotten involved in almost anything hard around injectables and aerosol delivery over the years. It's a field of deep expertise because of the combinative of power. Um, it, we were talking last night uh, about uh, an instance where uh, the delivery of viscous substance to the human body has been a real challenge as, as biologics come online. 
and uh, we were brought into that problem as, as folks were having a delivery issue, and um, we were able to combine some work we'd done in, in pipelines, where you know flowing oil through pipelines is a very challenging situation, or it was, because of the friction and the loss, the energy loss. The solution, obviously, uh, that, that's used today was one that we'd helped engineer there, and we were able to bring to the delivery of biologics and injectables. Uh, it's, it's fairly consistent that when that that real rub comes of, okay, we think we know what to do, how do we do it, right. that Patel's uh, gonna get involved. And you mentioned some difficult challenges and you said a little bit about neuroscience. And we know that the brain is uh, extremely complicated and it intersects with human behavior and many other kind of healthcare conditions, chronic healthcare conditions, et cetera, um, diabetes, hypertension, um, obesity. Now, when we think about neurotechnologies, I know that Patel has got um, expertise there. It's done some interesting work that we're going to talk about now. And uh, it really sees the potential of using technology and neuroscience together. And I'm sure a lot of companies are interested in that space because there's a huge upcoming potential there. Um, tell me a little bit about your insights in that neuroscience space. Well, Arsha, you know as well as anyone that um, I don't think it's coming, it's here. Uh, again, what your firm's done in, in helping children with, with challenges is powerful, it's here, it's today. Um, we see that the, uh, the, the next 10 years in neuroscience are gonna do things that, that absolutely shock us in the ability to create restorative and uh, advantage training of the human uh, condition. We, we know that we begin to know uh, how the human body works, how the human brain drives it, and how the neurological system implements it. Um, but it's big. It's a really big space. It's massively complicated. It's got the combinative uh, aspects of biology, chemistry. Um, you know, the microbiome alone um, will, be a, will be the human genome project of the future that's massively orders of magnitude better. That full interactive space is complicated. Our approach to these things is to tackle a problem. And let's solve a problem, as, as you've done, um, as, as others are doing. The one that we um, decided to tackle was to restore movement to uh, an individual who uh, had unfortunately uh, had a spinal cord uh, injury and had found himself uh, in, in a wheelchair and unable to uh, function. And um, we started working on this problem a handful of years ago. And um, we're working with an amazing patient, have been able to restore movement in a way that isn't tomorrow. This isn't theoretical. Um, maybe the best thing to do, do is you know, show the audience what has been done, what is real uh, as of today and moving forward. Wonderful. I think we have a video that we can watch about what your company has done here. I have always been kind of an adventurous person. I always liked to kind of go and explore when I was younger, rode roller coasters and all that kind of stuff, really wanting some sort of a thrill. My injury happened in July of 2010. I was on vacation with some friends. Me being the fearless one looking for excitement, I was the first one to get into the water. And I dive into a wave. Immediately I knew something was wrong because I couldn't get myself out of the water. The doctors told me that I had broken my neck and that most likely I'd be able to move my shoulders around but nothing else for the rest of my life. The first patient in an unprecedented amazing medical trial. A paralyzed man moving body. his arm for the first time. An amazing Ian's. medical breakthrough is giving hope no to people paralyzed. No human in Ian's condition has ever done it the way he just did. When we first hooked everything up, you know, for the first time of being able to move my hand, it was a big shock because, you know, it's something that I haven't, hadn't moved in about three and a half years at that point. You know, it's something that I always knew maybe someday something would happen. But now I know for sure that something will happen and it actually is happening. I think anyone that explores in their life, whether it be going out and looking for new things or doing a scientific experiment like I'm doing, really just wants to push the envelope and see if they can make any changes in the world. We're doing something that has never been done before. Ian is one of the uh, most amazing people you'll ever meet in your life. Um, the the, the uh, commitment he has to helping others uh, restore movement and restore freedom is, is powerful. Um, 
What's really fascinating about the work he's done with us is that he's able to create movements that we didn't code. So when I said earlier we talk about AI and say, this is real, um, underneath the system that pulls from his brain, his intent to move his hand, his he intent to take actions, we decode that, we translate that into movement for a sleeve. Uh, that sleeve has 120 points of uh, dry uh, uh, electrode stimulation at a micro level, allows that hand to move the way he intends it to do. Um, we coded it to do a certain set of things. You saw him playing um, Guitar Hero there. Not all of those movements were ones we coded. The power of the human brain combined with the power of deep learning technology is what enabled Ian to do things we couldn't do and continue to do that today. The, uh, uh, I believe it was Mark said a few minutes ago, we should never um, forego the opportunity to use machine learning, AI, deep learning to advance human conditions, I think fits very well here. Um, the, the power of that technology today, that's today, is um, it's transformational for someone like that. And for, for a soldier who voluntarily uh, signed up to serve their nation and came home in a wheelchair, uh, you know, the chance to get that soldier to brush his or her teeth again, it's powerful. And uh, we're right on the verge of that. Um, the stuff we're working now, as you may have noticed, Ian had a sensor coming out of his head, uh, electrodes. Um, that's largely impractical. It's great for, for him and it's better than anything he has. But we're working today with, uh, a, as we've said before, academia and the government, in this case DARPA, on uh, non-invasive and minimally invasive sensors um, with FIU on a uh, magnetic nanoparticle that's injectable that would become that sensor, uh, with CMU on some uh, very uh, unique ultrasound applications to get that brain wave out. This technology here, you'll see it at CES not long from now. You'll see, you'll see Ian and, and folks in his condition here participating fully in these events because of this technology, and it's just really powerful. I mean, it's, it's really phenomenal, and if you think medically, we have, say, a third of a million Americans with spinal cord injury. But when you actually kind of look out, you see this as not only a tool for addressing uh, deficits in terms of um, brain function, how it interacts with the mode system, but perhaps is an opportunity to augment augment human learning, augment human behavior, and look into the wellness and uh, enhancement space. I mean, the science looks like it has potential there. Absolutely, Arsha, as, as Brain Power has done um, with children, the sleeve that came out of this, the spin-off technologies are, are really uh, powerful. The sleeve that came out of this, that, that Battelle's come up with and invented, um, can sense the, the smallest movement of a muscle in order to be able to stimulate it. We had to do that. Well, we didn't really think of where that could be neat until we ran into some clinicians in the stroke field who said, boy, if you could tell me right after a stroke what the pop possibility of sp spontaneous recovery would be for a stroke victim, um, we would take a different course of action. We have to wait six months to know if there's a spontaneous response. Well, that's just one small instance. The ability to potentially have 24-hour physical therapy in a passive sense for a stroke victim could be transformational in their recovery. And then human performance training, which may be more likely uh, something we'd see at CES, um, for an athlete to be able to have 10% more control of their muscular uh, uh, efficiency and, and precision through, through uh, precise training uh, with this type of uh, technology, that's not far away. And it's pretty powerful and we're working with some, some folks now in that field. And we see so much at, at CES about just trying to give you that 1% edge, that 0.5% edge, and it's critical in athletics and all these other disciplines. Um, the other thing that you mentioned is you have very close relationships with academia. So you can really harness and capture their abilities. Um, with uh, defense and government as well. It sounds like you have a Rolodex based on all these past built relationships over a long time that you've developed, right? Yes. Um, you, you, you're around for 90 years. You kind of um, build some relationships, uh, and hopefully they're all pretty good. Um, we, we love working with academia, and we love working with industry and, and government to be right in the middle uh, of that nexus, to help that valley of frustration of technology be avoided. And, and I think it's important to note that you don't commercialize a product. So you've got a company that comes to you, or you work through academia or with parts of the government, but then you never actually commercialize or market a product yourself. That's, diff that's a different thing about Patel than 
some other organization. Yeah, our, our, our goal is to help um, Lilly, help uh, Johnson & Johnson and others bring a product to market. We don't have uh, you know, uh, the industrial go-to-market capabilities, nor do we desire to. We desire to be the world's largest and leading independent nonprofit research shop. And uh, we like that space very much. We love working with the scientists and the engineers and the researchers at firms who have um, a focus area but need all the other things to get their product through to market. Uh, and, and sometimes that includes bringing uh, technology we've developed and helping add that technology to their t technology. Uh, it's about as much fun as you can have. That's awesome. In terms of um, partners, I know that there are um, specific things that will make a, a partnership or an opportunity um, much more effective for you in terms of, you know, Johnson & Johnson, a bigger, more mature organization. When you think about your past partnerships, what have the best partnerships been for you in terms of who you're working with, which companies approach you, the value that they get? What does that look like? We love working with people who are transforming the world. People who are working in, in the health domains that really will make your life, our lives, our children's lives entirely different. Um, you know, from from today to ten years from now. The last the last uh, moderator asked that question, and um, we see that happening ever more in in biology and neuroscience, and, and those folks pushing that boundary, pushing that edge, um, and and with great impatience. Um, and also regard and respect for the regulatory environments we need to li uh, you know, live within. Because these are, complex, these are complex things that we're working in and there are, there are potential um, you know, risks that have to be uh, understood and, and mitigated. Um, but where, where firms have deep science, deep engineering, and they're committed to getting product to market, that's, that's where we find ourselves the best partner. Um, we, I worked for 20 years in publicly traded firms and they're wonderful and they make, they make the economy go and they make things happen and the, the incentive structure is wonderful and, and beautiful. The beauty of a nonprofit organization is we get to be pretty particular mm -hmm. about um, who we work with and uh, ensure that uh, they, they have the certainty of getting something to market. That's uh, important for us because the opportunity cost of working on something that, that may be really transformational but doesn't have the heft to get to market um, is, is one that we can come to regret. And, and in these fields that will uh, transform mm -hmm. our, our world, uh, we, we try to be a, a little bit particular about right. working with those firms that can get it to market. Some of these mature companies have research departments already. They have R&D departments who are trying to tackle some of these issues already. How do, how do you navigate, you know, how does someone approach Patel and say, hey, we've got our own R&D department working on this, but we need you to supercharge this product. We've got something that we can't quite figure out. We've got competitors that we know are working on the same thing. Yeah. How do you navigate those relationships and integrate and provide that service within? We actually love that conversation. Um, a lot of times our value add is not just uh, supercharging, but supercharging with some other technology, and mm -hmm. that makes that conversation pretty easy. Um, a lot of times, uh, we, since we don't desire to have public brand, despite the fact that I'm sitting here today, um, we don't challenge, we don't compete with our partners at all, and so we are um, pretty comfortable working through those IP discussions to ensure that we are able to educate some children, mm -hmm. that's really important to us, and reinvest in technology, but we're not trying to monetize, we're not trying to hit that IPO, and so we can be a lot more flexible about how those relationships work out. Um, the, the researchers and the scientists, uh, I, I wish we could take you all to Battelle, it's probably the, I don't know the only, but it, it, it is a corporate headquarters that's a lab. You walk in our front door and there's labs everywhere. Um, we're, we're a research shop. And so when the research departments from these other firms uh, know us and meet us, it's a pretty easy conversation right, right. because we're quickly in the science and the engineering. It sounds like let's there's a similar mindset to the, yeah. the teams that they already have. Yeah, let's just get it done. So if we have um, someone who's interested in connecting with Battelle, yeah. um, obviously huge organization, what if they're worried about costs or, oh, is this going to be compatible? What's the easiest way of someone to kind of reach out and engage with starting that conversation? They have an issue. What does the contact point look like? What is that process, that, that starting process with Battelle look like? So our digital footprint <laughs> uh, is pretty good. Um, we've, got a, we've got a wonderful front door uh, through that. A lot of our relationships come through the science side. 
um, our, our researchers and scientists and engineers, many of whom are, are well known in the world and, and, and have a deep pedigree and footprint, uh, often is how people find us. Um, because people working in a hard nanoparticle technology generally know that you're going to want to talk to Patel. People working in, in uh, you know, injectables and aerosolizations know that. And, and so uh, that's often what happens. At the same time, we like to hear those hard problems, and I'd love to take those calls myself because those are a lot of fun. Wow. Well, I really appreciate uh, your time. It sounds like you're supercharging projects and um, making things real, which is something that we don't see as often as perhaps we, we should. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you.